And uh, with us, we have Indu. Indu Alagar Sami. How bad did I do that? You did pretty good. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> I'm trying. Nice to meet you, Indu. Nice to meet you as well. So for, for the, the people uh, watching, Indu is a global lead applications architect and she helps her clients uh, modernize their legacy systems, which I'm guessing must be quite fun knowing, thinking about some of the legacy systems I've encountered over the years. Yes, most, most definitely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, in, in your talk, you are discussing the, the intersection between uh, DDD, domain-driven design, as a software discipline and, and messaging as a technology, of course, when building reliable systems. Um, how how did, you, did you get to this intersection? I wanted to ask. Yeah, um, so I think a while ago, uh, I think around 2009-2010, I was building um, Microsoft, um, like everything based on RPC services. I was building WCF services and, you know, so that was like my my thing, right? Like I know you're like frowning, I can see. <laughs> I, I work with WCF, so that, that, that's, that's the flashbacks. Oh yeah, so. We, we did the like... same, so we can totally relate. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, you know, into the plumbing, looking at behavior inspectors and like, you know, all, all interesting kind of stuff, right? So, and then I, um, I, I switched companies and I uh, had to work for, the domain was um, servicing banks and mortgage companies. So in 2009 and 10, US had a really uh, bad real estate meltdown, uh, the market crashed. Lots of people lost homes. The company that I worked for was in the um, domain of actually sending these uh, letters, delinquent letters, on behalf of banks to uh, homeowners. So it had to go through like uh, a lot of regulations. Uh, it had to follow a process, and, and so this company had like it was an idea that you know someone came up with, and two people, three people put the software together. And all of a sudden with the real estate market crash, like for them, business boomed. And I was hired as an architect to see, you know, how can we scale the system? And, and, and so I started looking into it and um, we had hired like uh, at the time, some guy from Microsoft to kind of like look into the architecture to see what the problems were. And he mentioned temporal coupling. And for me, like that was like the first time I'd heard of the word and I wanted to kind of dig in and understand. And, and, and then it started like, you know, I, I started um, looking into like, how do we solve this? And, and that's how I ended up with event-driven architecture. I read uh, a fantastic paper uh, by um, Gregor Hoppe um, on event-driven architecture programming uh, with the call stack, so, something like that. It was a PDF and, and I read that in like, for me, like I, it was like, that was like my moment of like, hey, there's a different way to design good architecture. And uh, like, I, I, I think like I've been like, you know, not seeing a lot of things. I mean, in 2010, and I was already like a senior engineer, you know, um, like with lots of experience and, and yet, like for me, I was like, holy Moses, like I, I like, you know, I had like considered the style of architecture. And uh, so it was like a brand new thing. And, and so I wanted to see how I can build event-driven architectures. And then I came across End Service Bus, which is a messaging system. I wanted, I was looking for PubSub based, in, how, how can I implement these event-driven architecture patterns uh, in .NET code quickly and easily and, and address the business problem. So I, um, so I, I came across in service bus and, and watched a lot of Udi Dahan's talks. And, and, and so that's kind of like, you know, my uh, walk into event-driven architecture. And while I was building like, you know, for this uh, company software, I made a lot of mistakes and, and then I came across like domain driven design and then like the, the two kind of like, it, it just blew my mind. So that's, that's kind of where my journey started and like I've been trying to learn 
Um, and, and there's so much to learn every single day. So I hope, I mean, it was a long answer, but I hope. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it was a, a really, really good answer. No, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn more about what you've learned. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I'm guessing you, you have the floor now. Thank you. So we'll just uh, fade slowly to the background. All right. So I will share my screen and uh, see. Um, so we know what the talk is going to be. It's going to be about uh, how you can mix uh, DDD and uh, event-driven style of architecture when you do that what you end up with, uh, with a natural set of services that are autonomous. And um, so Vlad already gave an intro, I'm gonna skip. So um, <laughs> this is like a funny story. Um, the, the reason you're looking at an auto box on your screen is because I'm the notorious iPhone killer of the family. So my kids got tired and, and we were looking at like an indestructible phone case. Uh, but uh, yeah, they did get me one for Christmas and uh, like I haven't broken an iPhone since. So that's the good news. But okay, so coming to the, the software side of it, if you look at the screen, you see a lot of information. Uh, you see an uh, image, uh, you see uh, some description, Amazon's got this uh, uh, hey offers, like the price is this, but if you get this Amazon Prime Rewards card, uh, you get uh, you get a like a different discount, etc. So there's a lot of information. When we try to sort of model all this information, typically we tend to look at it as an entity. Uh, we look at it as an entity and and start putting structure to this model. So we have a model called product, and all the things that you saw on the screen, like name, description. So we start adding attributes. So um, it's, it's okay, this is what we've been used to. And uh, you know, uh, if you're in the object-oriented world or started with OO like me, um, we were taught that you know, nouns were classes and, and you know, so we uh, OO also taught us a lot of things like focusing into behavior, but somehow we tend to kind of miss that and we like this entity because it's something we see the structure is more there so we start modeling things as uh like this as a as a as a you know one one entity but if you ask what a product is to different teams it might mean different things for someone that's working in the sales team it's what they're trying to sell um in how they want to make it enticing to the, to the user. For someone that's in the inventory department, it's something that either they have or they don't have. Uh, for someone that's in shipping, it's all about like, hey, how can I get this from one place to another? So even though, you know, all these teams, they have different ways and different concerns, they tend to look at the same 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 thing. They tend to refer it as product, but in their minds, in their departments, they have different rules and different um, different uh, different things that is associated with the product. So, when we have this one giant entity called product, and over time it tends to become really complex, it starts to add duplications and contradictions. Um, what do I mean? So let's say you have this thing attribute called weight and the sales team looks at it and goes, yes, this is for me. It's like uh, how much this thing weighs. I want to market it. Like if, if you're like Apple, if you're, if you're talking about like the MacBook Air, for them, it's like how light it is. So they put the, the, the weight of the product, um, which might be, I don't know, uh, less than a pound or I don't know what the actual weight is. Now, the inventory team looks at the attribute and goes, hey, this um, model already has something for weight. But keep in mind, for the inventory people, it is a lot more. It's not just the product. 
but it goes into the box. They have, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole package weight is what, you know, they're going to be paying for. So that weight is different from what the sales team considers as weight. But yet when you have this one model and you, you know, the sales team or the inventory team made some updates, all of a sudden you start looking at weird results and, you know, based on use cases. And so you start to notice these contradictions at runtime, and these are kind of hard to catch and debug because uh, because because it, you know um, it, it's you you're trying to figure out like what change occurred for what use case and 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 you got to dig real hard. So what's one way we can solve this? Well, we can add uh, qualifying uh, names. So instead of calling it wait. We call it display weight and um, uh, shipping weight or, or something like a qualifier to kind of know what, what this is. Yes, it would solve the problem, but now your model is getting bloated instead of like where you had product weight. Now you've got two attributes for weight and dimensions and, and so on. So um, your model is now getting bloated. So these are some of the troubles why like you can't have like one model to sort of rule them all. And this is where domain driven design comes up with this con uh, concept called bounded context. So bounded context, I, I think of it as a safe space. So uh, we've got product and uh, we've got these different teams or different use cases and rules and, and, and stuff. So each of these can have its own space. For example, for, for sales, they can have a model called product. And in this bounded context, they use the same language. They, um, they have the rules that is uh, pertinent to sales, which is completely different uh, from another bounded context, which is say inventory, where in that space, there can be a model for product with different rules and so on. So now you've got these different spaces where these models are free to evolve. So the advantage of, of this is that for the teams um, that's working in, the, uh, in that context, it gives clarity. Um, it, they can like make uh, changes more easily. Uh, they don't have to like work with like, you know, worry about changing um, some, some field in their model, which is going to impact the other, um, the other team's models, right? So you have, uh, for the other teams, it brings you freedom. You can actually do your changes and not worry about breaking. So in the, in the example we talked about, you had the inventory team adding, uh, like updating a weight that broke the sales team. You're not going to have such contradictions. In, in the, also the problem with uh, like using these uh, display weight and um, you know, qualifiers like that in the same model is that now when, when these, um, when, on camera. Okay, sorry. <laughs> This is what uh, happens when you have kids and dogs. <laughs> Sorry. So um, the thing with adding uh, qualifying fields is um, that you kind of tend to lose the language of the domain experts. So for the person in sales, they still refer to it as product and weight. Now, when they come to you and give you a, um, a uh, what do you call it? a new requirement, you're doing these translations in your head. Like, you know, when they say weight, okay, it's this team. So it's, it's uh, display weight, not, not um, shipping weight. And, and so, so you're losing the context of the domain expert, your code diverges. There's all these translations you are making and you're like moving further and further away from business. So what, the fundamental thing that domain driven design kind of tells you is like, you know, focus on the behavior. I, I see DDD as a set of disciplines that kind of like focuses you on the right way. 
And so you can uh, build your code, build your design uh, better that suits and aligns more with the business. Because ultimately, the reason, you know, we're building software, we're designing software is to help the goals of the business, is to move, it, it's to help them get better in the market, uh, put solutions and products out there faster so we can compete better in the market. So there's always that business context. It's not just about writing code and pushing it into production. So, so the, the, the second we start losing the context of the domain, when our code diverges, then you're in this area where you're losing all the benefits of, um, you know, of being aligned to the business. So um, the question is, okay, you have these boundaries, I mean, ba the bounded context, like uh, areas where these models live, but how do you know where the boundary is? How do you know whether this thing belongs in a model in one context or whether it belongs in a model in a different context. So that's where the kind of difficulties lie. And I have like over the years learned some ways where I can uh, try and, and figure that out. Um, so for example, let's say you have this model and you've got, um, ask yourself like, you know, would there ever be a business rule that says all products that starts with D you need to decrement the stock availability, you know, uh, by five. Like, would there ever be a case or a business rule? If that's not the case, if there is no need for transactional integrity between those two things, clearly that's an indicator that those don't belong in the same model. So that's one way to look at it and, and say, hey, clearly these are two separate things. It looks like they, they don't belong uh, together. The other way is uh, you could split according to the teams or departments because when you look at it, these teams tend to already have these business rules. And, and so it might be a good way to start and um, is to start there. And then as you go along, you might find that, hey, um, they, they are different or you might merge two models to be part of the same context, but that's definitely a good place that you can start. So again, like, you know, you've got these three departments, sales, inventory, shipping, and, and they all refer to product and they can have, for example, uh, the shipping uh, context, there's a model called product, there's dimensions, and there's a, a model called product same name, but in a different context, sales also has dimensions. These two are separate. They have different meanings in their own context. For the sales context, it's all about how sleek and elegant the product is that it's marketable. For the shipping, the dimensions could be that of the box. Um, it goes in a what size box, uh, three by four, um, whatever, right? So, so they're different. And by having them separately, you can evolve them differently. So uh, without touching sales. So to me, like this is the uh, beauty of bounded context. And, um, and, and like, you know, for me, this was like a, um, also where I stopped to stopped and started to think of like, you know, this sort of gives me the flexibility to uh, autonomy and other features. The most important thing that DDD talks about is, is actually to focus on the behavior. A lot of times we focus on the entities and the structure, but we, um, we fail to look at the actual behavior. So in this example, like, you know, um, there's like Amazon gives you $70 off if you get a prime reward. So clearly there is some interaction between uh, like, you know, your, um, your, your cost component versus this award component. So you, you start to look at behavior, you might start to model things differently as opposed to purely from a structural point of view. So I wanna take a quick stop in the sense like, you know, here we are, um, we now understand why um, at this point, why we can't have one unified model 
because of all the complications. We understand how bounded contexts actually, um, actually help in, in having clear and separate models as a way, but a system on the whole needs to communicate. And in order to do its entire job, it's not just islands of, of things, but these islands of things need to talk to each other. And, and that's where, for me, even driven style of architecture comes in. And um, communication can be done via a lot of, uh, sorry, are there any questions so far? A quick check. Okay. So, um, so this is where, like, you know, there are different modes of communication, obviously. And for me, this is where even driven style of architecture and using messaging is, is uh, super important. Um, when you're using messages, you can, um, although there are different categories of, of how you classify messages, two important classifications are what you call as commands, what you call as events. They're still messages. Even driven architecture is just a style of uh, architecture where you've got software modules talking to each other using messages. They send, they send a message and the receiver gets the message and knows what to do. So uh, <clears throat> this, uh, like there's, a, there's a book, uh, Enterprise Integration Patterns by Gregor Hoppe and Bobby uh, W. And this book talks about so many different kinds of ways you can use messaging patterns. Um, there's a lot of patterns, like over a hundred different patterns, and they're all useful in, in, in doing, um, uh, in, in, um, in executing like a certain, certain way of doing things using messages. So, um, so command is like, you can think of a command as a message that is sent to just one party and command. So you can think of, um, you can send a message called uh, process credit card to some software thing that's going to charge your card. And so commands can fail. So when you try to say process credit card, it can fail. Um, they may not be money in the account. They, you know, um, so it could have gotten declined or they could have been a, a, like a fraudulent freeze. So could have, there could be so many reasons why the command can fail. But the interesting thing is that commands can fail. Domain events, on the other hand, are also messages, but you can think of them as a broadcast type of message. So when you publish something, it goes to multiple parties that are interested in this event. And so therefore, an event um, is something that can't be changed. Once you publish it, it's like a, a version of truth that just happened. And so because there could be um, downstream subscribers listening to this, they might kick off their own processes once they receive this event. So that's why you, you can't, uh, an event is something that can't fail. Like you only publish it after the fact. So how you name things matter. So I tend to use um, commands as active verbs and e events in the past tense. Um, so in, in the way you name these events is also important. Um, so uh, it, it has to clarify something of business importance, something that's uh, in the, in the, you know, from uh, the domain perspective. So, uh, Let's take this case, use case where let's say, um, you know, you've booked a flight in the airline, uh, like it's the, the flight that you're supposed to fly was like a Boeing, uh, I don't know, 787 or something. And uh, the, the uh, for whatever reason, the flight needed to be maintained, they replaced it with a different flight. So the aircraft type has changed. So when this happens, passengers get notified with a new booking proposal. And uh, so, because it's a change, you as a passenger have an option to either cancel a flight or you can say, okay, I accept this uh, thing. So this happened uh, with Norwegian, although it wasn't a flight type change, um, they, they had to reroute my flight 
So I was given a chance to either cancel uh, the get full refund or take my new uh, new route. So um, in this case, you've got a business process and it can be triggered by an event from one bounded context. And, and so if you think about flight planning as a bounded context, the, one, the context that involves all the rules about what flights uh, you know, uh, are and, and it's in charge of the planning. So that can publish an event called aircraft type has changed. Now the booking context, which is completely a different context, doesn't deal with flights, but deals with lots of bookings, need to know. So in this case, they're communicating via events. And when, just like in object orientation, uh, we had like, you know, uh, nouns for classes, you can think of when or whenever as a indicator of events. So um, when, when um, your business stakeholders come to you and, and just use language like, you know, when, uh, when the flight, flight type changes, uh, we have to issue a notification to our passengers. So that's an event. So, so aircraft type has changed is an event. So you can, uh, you can deduce using this little trick uh, of like when you listen to language from the domain experts that use when or whenever. Now business process um, like can also be like, you know, take part in multiple messages. So what I'm saying is, okay, once the aircraft type has changed, uh, the booking context receives that event, lots of things need to happen. It might send off commands to, uh, you know, other software modules within its bounded context and can publish an event. So multiple messages can take part in a business process. So in terms of like, how do you actually implement this sort of a thing um, where multiple events take part in, in, um, in, in the same uh, process, this is where the saga pattern uh, becomes very useful. Now, in the domain-driven world, I think it's the process manager. Um, in, in other different worlds, uh, it's also called a saga pattern. I'm sure there's like, you know, um, a purist uh, name challenge <laughs> uh, debates go on. Uh, but I, like when I learned it, I, since I used N-Service Bus, I referred to this as saga pattern. Uh, so, but you can think of it as a process manager as well. Now, the interesting thing, like the, the main use of the saga pattern is what it does is like when these multiple messages are involved, there needs to be some state. So uh, the saga pattern has some kind of like a little persistent state. And what it does is like as messages come, you can um, drop some important information about that message in your state object. And then when you receive another message, you hydrate that state back, check what you need to do when this message arrives. And typically the saga pattern is just like a um, orchestrator. It doesn't do a lot of heavy handling, um, like processing. Uh, so what it does is it, it just gets messages, checks state, and sends out messages. So, so it's, it's a um, coordinator of sorts. So, um, so now the, the important thing is, okay, so how do we actually figure out what these events are? And this is where event storming as a technique comes in very handy. <clears throat> so in event storming, uh, what we see is like, you know, um, you have like a, a, a wall filled with white paper and lost, lots of post-its. So, uh, and, and this is a useful collaborative technique where you have the domain experts and the architects, the key decision makers, all in the same room. Well, uh, in, in, the, in the COVID world, in the same virtual room, and you can use Miro.com, the whiteboarding tool to do this. But in a traditional world um, where I have done work, uh, workshops with event storming, it's like uh, all of us get together and we have uh, different post-its and we ask questions and we collaborate. And this is a process. And at the end of this process, you identify, you know, what are the useful business events? And, and basically here is where like you're trying to figure out the actual business process, like in validating your assumptions. 
we as software engineers and architects, we can't make certain decisions of how our code needs to behave. Only our business or domain experts can, can, um, can tell us. So uh, this is quite important that we have like our assumptions clarified uh, with them. It's, it's easy to throw away sticky notes, but it's, it's easy to throw away code. Um, I want to share an example. Uh, I, when I was working at the mortgage company, um, so there was a business process where, uh, <clears throat> so when we get these letters, um, so it has to go through, we have to make a template and, and it's like a back and forth approval process. And so it was a lot of manual work uh, this person was doing, sending emails, getting answers back, so uh, and then finalizing this, this, this template. So uh, the company wanted to automate this, automate this because um, we, we thought, okay, it could be a portal in where clients can drop in and we can have this back and forth. Um, and, and it would be very useful for clients as well. So we saw business value and we thought, hey, we could automate, automate this. So um, the trouble was, you know, a person spends a whole month, like someone um, like had like UI UX, um, some, some guy from, you know, UI UX team built this. And, um, and, and so we had the first, uh, it, it, it took one senior development engineer almost a month to finish this first, first draft. Right. And then when we actually handed it to the person saying like, hey, here you go, uh, it's going to make your life easy. And she looked at it saying, no, it's not going to make my life easy because this doesn't do X, Y and Z without that. You know, I can't really find this useful. So the point here is, you know, she was a, a key domain expert and no one had thought of asking her or collaborating with her. And a lot of assumptions were made in the software. And after one month, you know, we had to have a version two. And in the version two, of course, she was included. And there was a kickoff meeting similar to the concept of domain, um, I mean, event storming, but where, um, where all the stakeholders were there to try to, where software engineers and architects try to validate their assumptions. So my point is this sort of collaboration is super important and event storming helps with that, with, with trying to get our assumptions uh, verified in trying to understand the behavior of what this business process is and what are the impacts. Certain decisions, we can't make it, but when we ask those questions, um, business might not have an answer for that, but it'll make them think and say, okay, uh, why don't we do this instead? So that's what we want. And so by understanding this, we kind of understand how our code needs to be built. So uh, when when we model using event storming, this is like a, like a um, fast course, so to speak. You try to figure out like what the main events are. And it, at this point, you don't worry about what bounded context. You just try, you, you're just trying to figure out in that business process that you're trying to model, what are all these be uh, key <laughs> business events? So in the in this case for this business process that we're looking at, aircraft type has changed, um, and because of that, you know, booking could come up with say like you know booking was changed, so booked flight was changed. And the user can cancel the booking, in which case you have an event booking was canceled. The user could say, hey, I like this booking, in which case you have booking was confirmed. And so this, again, could these events could be in different contexts. Um, so once you have the events, can I ask yourself, like, OK, what needs to happen? What are the commands? And so here, you know, when aircraft type was changed, we need to have a command that tells another module to go rebook the flight, which then, um, you know, the booking, uh, that module would publish this event. And once that event is published, it's time to notify the customer about flight change. And so the question becomes like, okay, we've notified the customer, how long do we wait? 
And, and so this is again, like an assumption that we can't make, but this is where business clarifies. And so in this case, let's say it's five days. You can even model time as a message. So, um, so you have whatever component that's waiting. And then when that time is done, can publish this uh, or, uh, you know, can trigger this command saying request timeout for five days. So um, sort of like a wake up thing. And, and then, you know, booking was confirmed. So, so you go through this process of, uh, of, you know, finding events, finding the relevant commands. And then when you're dealing with commands, you kind of ask yourself, what, what, what do I need to do if this command fails? Are there any business behavior implications? So uh, you, you kind of model that as well. So your, your modeling becomes rich in, in terms of behavior. And now like the good thing here is you've identified like your key events and commands. And now you can actually take that and go code. So um, this uh, is like a pseudo code from Ensevis Bus. Uh, again, um, I used to work for a particular uh, software, the makers of Ensevis Bus. So I've written a lot of, uh, and before that I was using N service bus. So a lot of my examples have uh, N service bus in it, but um, N service bus is like one um, bus for like a messaging system for .NET based um, uh, uh, code. There's also open source um, mass transit. And so it, it really is up to you to use what you want. But my point is like, once you've identified the, the actual messages, then, then coding becomes like a lot easier. You have a class uh, that, you know, uh, that gets uh, triggered when, when this message arrives in, in, that, in that handler, you go do what you need to do. In this case, find all the relevant, relevant booking references and uh, we need to rebook that. And there's another um, uh, uh, a class that handles this rebook flight and, and you know, and then publishes that booking flight was changed. And you have a saga and for the grace uh, period and you know, to wait uh, once this uh, you know, book flight was changed, we need to notify the customer and wait for a certain period of time and also listen for A, did the customer cancel the booking within that time? So you've got a saga for this. So, so this is like the easy process. Uh, like writing, uh, like, but figuring out the business behavior, that's like more the hard part, which involves a lot of collaboration. And, and so um, the trouble here is, as I find out, uh, is naming things are hard. Uh, what I mean is like, you know, when you're talking about these events, messages, um, the, the, some of the mistakes that I did in the past was I would call it um, PDF document was generated. Hey, it's a good name for an event. It's in the past tense, um, you know, but it doesn't really convey anything of business importance. What is a PDF document generated to business? It's not really relevant. But if I had named the event uh, as, uh, you know, um, uh, mail was shipped or, or something like that, that would be uh, like, you know, notification was uh, uh, like, you know, something in the, in the business context. In that, in, in, the, in that domain, it was a letter that was being uh, shipped. So a certified letter was shipped. That would have been relevant in the context of, um, of a, uh, from the business perspective, because they understand what happens when the letters were shipped uh, versus PDF document was generated. So when they come to us and say, hey, uh, when, whenever you, know, you send out the uh, certified letter, now there's like new requirements for state regulations that you need to do, go do X, Y, and Z. Now you can like connect the dots and, and go, okay, I already have an event when certified letter was shipped. Now, all I need to do is like add a subscriber that listens to that event, which can handle the regulation bit. And when you do that, it doesn't impact any of the rest of the software. All your new stuff is in this subscriber module. So this is why, you know, how you name becomes super important. 
I used to also, um, the one of the other mistakes that I did was um, all my names were like very CRUD oriented, something um, customer was created, um, you know, customer was deleted. I mean, you don't really create customers and delete customers, right? Uh, so maybe, you know, customer was onboarded would be a better domain term. Like, so, so this is where it is hard. And um, I guess naming is one of the, the hardest things in, in, in computer science, right? And so, uh, so this is where, you know, it, it, comes, it comes with practice. And the more you practice, the more you get better at it. And uh, you, this is where also code reviews or uh, like, you know, talking about your business domain experts uh, like can help you come up with better names for your events. Those should have um, business names. Everything that you do, your code, uh, your, your classes, it, it has to have, like it has to imply like the language of the domain. So that's what you need to bring in. The more you do that, the more your code is going to be aligned with the business. So if we look at our original requirement very carefully, the requirement said, Pastor gets notified with a new booking proposal. And yet, like I had named all this, like, you know, rebook flight. We weren't really rebooking a flight. We had to come up with like a proposal. So. These are things that you are going to uh, find out. You might have a, like, you know, you might have coded a certain model based on what you know. But as you, as you learn new things from the domain, you have to go back and fix these things. And this exactly is how you're going to be more and more aligned with your business. This constant, you know, learning and updating your models. So again, it's not, you know, nothing to do with booking flights, but instead a rebooking was proposed. Uh, we're notifying customer about proposed rebooking and uh, it, it was rebooking was accepted. So things like that. And also you wanna have a healthy uh, obsession with language. Like one, like a lot of, I mean, a lot of times uh, like when initially I would name my like a uh, message class that was handling uh, like a, a message. So uh, it, like, for example, a class that handles I, uh, aircraft type was changed. I would have it as aircraft type was changed handler. Like what does this handler mean? It, the handler is just like an implementation detail, uh, so to speak. And aircraft type was changed is my message. But what does this class actually do? And you know, the, this class was trying to propose new rebooking when this aircraft type was changed. So be explicit um, in what you are doing. And, and again, your class names is, is coinciding with the, the domain. And again, this wasn't a booking change policy. My saga was for um, how to deal with grace periods. So when we, when we are aligning the language of our models and classes um, according to the domain, the more close we are to uh, to react or learn, like you know, when new requirements come in, it's easy for us to find the right places to make changes in a in a healthy way, in an easy way. Um, and another thing I used to do was like you know, I, since I was like doing a lot of Microsoft .dotnet um, uh, stuff, I used ReSharper and it generates properties with a getter setter, right? And, uh, but messages are immutable. So why have setters in them? Use the constructors when you're trying to uh, like, you know, construct the object and after that, it shouldn't be changed. Um, so get rid of the public setters. And um, in, in the other interesting thing here is, sorry, there could be some concepts in the domain that are immutable. If that's the case, try and make that so in your, uh, in, in your code. Um, so for example, if you can't uh, change something once it's created, make sure that you know, nothing goes back, there's no update methods or, or anything like that. So make that concept immutable in your code as well. Uh, the counter heuristic to that, um, as my friend Matthias would say, is that if a framework is making it hard for you to do so, um, then don't fight the framework. So, so make that make that judgment call. 
again, you're trying to be as close to the domain as possible. So um, these are some of my, my like, you know, techniques and stuff that I use. In uh, Vlad, we talked about temporal coupling uh, when, I, when I started way back. So here's, uh, here's how uh, this, this can come in, right? Can sneak up. So you've, let's say uh, you've got a requirement they changed it. So let's say that they don't want to notify every single passenger, but only who are flying business class or who have platinum loyalty. Ooh, now all of a sudden you've got, you know, booking context and uh, it receives this uh, event, but booking does not know anything about loyalty, like whether a customer is platinum or uh, whatever is done by the loyalty context. And some module over there knows this. So we've got booking context wanting some information from loyalty context. So the traditional way is like we have an RPC call where we go, okay, hey, uh, I got this event. I need to go and query the loyalty context, um, make an RPC call and get loyalty status. Once the status comes back, you process that information and you get back with the event. So this exactly is temporal coupling because you've got two modules. You've got this proposed booking, which is in the booking context. You've got this promote customer, which is in the loyalty context. This, this module in booking can't proceed unless it hears back from um, the loyalty context. So these are coupled you know, in time. So coupling is just a dependency and temporal is time-based. So the trouble here is for whatever reason, um, loyalty context is down, your booking is stuck. You can't proceed with giving uh, the customer, you know, uh, uh, um, a new value. So this is kind of, this is temporal coupling and this is like the killer of scalability. And, um, in, and so in, in the case that I was talking about, all our modules were, were kind of like, you know, filled with this sort of uh, dependencies and where one module is down and, and you can't throw money and update the hardware and, and scale. That's not going to help in this case. So how do we solve this? And how do we make autonomous decisions? Because we want to be able to update loyalty and booking in different times without like, you know, it being dependent on each other. So this is again where event-driven architecture comes to the rescue. So whenever like loyalty, you know, is updating customers to promoting them to gold or platinum, it publishes an events. Booking is listening to these events. And because, you know, of this dependency, it, it needs to know, but what it's doing is it receives these events and then stores it in its database. Now, when the flight planning is publishing aircraft type has changed, what uh, the proposed rebooking module just looks inside its own database to figure out, hey, is this person got gold or platinum? And based on that, it can proceed. Now in this model, loyalty and flight planning are completely autonomous. And so this uh, proposed rebooking module, you can change that without impacting loyalty, or you can change loyalty modules uh, and you know, without putting a stop to booking. What this brings to picture is that it brings this sort of staleness um, upfront as a design decision. So, you know, it brings up interesting questions like, hey, what happens if we um, like, you know, notify this customer and then like two seconds later, we got the event um, saying that, you know, they were demoted or then what do we do? So this is where, you know, um, business needs to answer saying like, hey, we will, uh, we, we will, uh, uh, it's okay. It's like a one-off. It doesn't matter to us. It's fine. And, and so there needs to be no code changes done. So these, this is where, you know, you start to think about these latency and, and you uh, ask these questions and make the behavior match what your business wants. And in the previous model, a lot of times we think of RPC as like, you know, uh, like in the moment consistency, but, you know, ask yourself, 
The same problem could have happened even in the previous case. As soon as you made the call and got back the result, two seconds later, that data and loyalty could have changed. But you know, the assumption there was, hey, everything is fine. But here in this model, it brings that staleness up to the, to the design forefront. And so you're able to take better decisions and make, you know, ask uh, relevant questions to the domain experts and, um, and deal with it. So in this sort of model, deployments become like much nicer. Um, you can have a side-by-side -side type of, uh, you know, um, uh, deployment. Because you have a queue, all these messages are being passed and, and that's where queuing and uh, you've got different um, uh, transports. Like if you're, uh, it, it, you can use RabbitMQ, you can use, um, uh, in, if you're in the cloud, you've got SQS from Amazon, you've got Azure uh, Service Bus from uh, Azure, uh, Microsoft. So you've got these different transports to kind of deliver these messages. So um, now, like, you know, because these messages are in the queue, uh, even if modules like stop and go, you haven't lost anything, you know, when your module comes back up it's going to read the queue and all the messages are there. So it gives you the sort of reliability as well. So like in this case, let's say you, um, you, you're, you've got the V1.1 and you watch it and you see how 1.1 uh, is doing. And if, uh, if everything is good, you know, you kill the version one and you're, you're live, mm -hmm. uh, you're live with 1.1. Now, um, not all, <laughs> There she goes. Um, so not all uh, like, you know, deployments succeed. So if for some reason um, you, let me let her out. So if for some reason uh, the deployment doesn't um, work as expected, one thing you're always noticing is as you're, um, as you're um, like deploying, made deployments, you watch the error queue. Um, so error queue is like a special queue where you, when messages fail, it gets forwarded to this, uh, to this queue. So poison queue, um, uh, et cetera. So when, when messages end up there, it means your module is not doing well. So you need to, you need to, um, um, you know, watch this queue, especially during deployments. But the good news is what you can do is you can stop the offending module version and then take these messages from that are sitting in the queue and, and send it back to the V1.0. So for this to work, your versions need to be backwards compatible. So don't introduce changes that's going to break. And, and if, as long as you're backwards compatible, this sort of, uh, this sort of model will work great. So the, there are, if there are three things I want you to take away from this talk, first is, Collaboration is, is the most important thing. And as software engineers, we get, um, you know, giddy with technologies and microservices and, and things like that. Uh, but the real, real crux is like getting the knowledge from the domain experts, making sure we are building the right software. Uh, so more than the technology, it, it's that, you know, important information that we need to get assumptions verified. And the only way to check those boxes is to have a collaborative approach. So use uh, something like event storming or a, like nowadays with Miro, I've used that and seems to be very effective. So, um, so do that. And the other important thing is that models are not perfect. In fact, when we come up with uh, the first version, um, like in this example, like how I had named things and it was wrong, it was wrong. They're not perfect. So the way for us to be constantly evolving with the business is if we learn every day, like, you know, through conversations. Uh, and once we learn that our code, our models are not actually matching the domain, go ahead and refactor. And and again, when you're refactoring, try to use the language of the domain in your, in your code. And, and so if you do this, like as you evolve, your code is going to evolve 
and you are going to um, be in a place where making changes become easy and maintenance is, is a lot easier. And if you want autonomy, then use events as a mechanism to communicate. So between bounded context, use events. Within a bounded context, you can use commands as a way to um, you know, uh, do something. But if you, if you use events to communicate between bounded contexts, it gives you this sort of autonomy where like, you know, where you can uh, have all these um, benefits that we want from microservices, uh, where, you know, there's like, we can update a small module without impacting a lot of things. And, and so that's what we want. So I really hope um, you got something out of this. And I want to thank you for spending your time with me especially in this pandemic and like you, I can't wait for this pandemic to be over and, uh, and actually start meeting uh, people at conferences in, in, in real life. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Indu. Hopefully in, in the future, yeah, we'll be able to, to meet in person and not teleport like this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we also have a couple of questions if you do sure. have some, some time. Yes. Um, all right. So uh, the first one would be, could a business process be triggered by a command from a different bounded context or only, from, or only domain events should be exchanged uh, cross context boundary? Yeah. So I, um, when I design, I typically, um, I typically don't have commands. Uh, to other bounded contexts for the reason that commands can fail. And um, so, so, and also I kind of like think of it as uh, you're telling the other bounded context what to do. And uh, instead of like letting them do reacting based on events. So um, the, the example I talk about is like, you know, uh, I don't know, like this, this funny thing comes to my head. I don't know if you watched the movie uh, 300. Um, like you've got like, you know, like a guy from Xerxes, the Persian guys, like trying to send a messenger to Sparta. And if you think of like Sparta as like a different entity, like you've got the, the, the Greeks, like with their pride. And then Xerxes sends a message to Sparta saying like, you know, hey, bow down to Xerxes, like, you know, be part of our empire. And they push him into the well. So, you know, so, so my, 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 you know, so you, you can't, you, so this is why, not this is why, but like I, I, I tend to typically model uh, uh, events triggering stuff to other bounded context, kind of like respect that space for that autonomy. Uh, because if commands fail, then what are you going to do, right? So, um, so I, I tend to use events. But this is not like a hard, you should, you shouldn't. So I would say, you know, take a look at your use case. If it makes sense, uh, okay. But again, like, you know, ask yourself, like, you know, commands can fail. And so how are you going to react if this command fails? Uh, what are going to be the implications? Are there going to, going to be any messages across? Um, the one thing that I forgot to mention is that, you know, when you're talking about like, you know, the whole purpose of this event-driven um, style is to be loosely coupled, um, but like you have to be careful about the schema of the message because you could end up like coupling yourself based on schema because the, the schema needs to be shared between the sender and the receiver in order to understand these messages. So yeah, you're not sharing implementation, but you're sharing the schema. So if you put a lot of information in your event and the subscriber gets it, and now you're like, say, hey, I'm gonna start changing my event schema, then you know you could end up. So you want to be very careful about like what you want to expose out of one bounded context in your events. And 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 so you know this doesn't cause problems. So I, I hope that was clear. Yeah, I, I think so. Basically, yeah, as Diana said earlier, it, it, it depends. 
<laughs> it depends would, a lot on, on your country. Now. <laughs> you can call me <laughs> next time with this. So nobody likes to being told what to do and bothered <laughs> to start no different <laughs> than people, right? <laughs> I, I think of a bounded context as like separate, you know, um, se separate uh, uh, like areas of authority. Uh, and I, I tend to think that they react to events uh, when like, you know, when like if you're like Amazon, you're um, say uh, like when you when you're trying to buy a book and Amazon will send you immediately saying like, hey, I received your order. Right. And now there's going to be this payment context that's also listening to this order received. And that's going to charge the card and do the settlements. I mean, you think that um, you paid the card and it works right away, but still the payment is like a separate context. They could come back to you and say, when se if settlement fails, like, you know, hey, I couldn't process your order. That's done by a separate, uh, has happened to me. So that's all I know. <laughs> So it's like, hey, update your card. Like, oh crap, okay. Uh, you know, so um, so you've got these different contexts, but they're all like, you know, um, reacting to events and doing their own thing. So the, the, the event that you get is like a notification of something significant happened in the business. So order has received. And that the only information that's interesting there for that payment thing is the order ID, to do the correlation across these contexts, the order ID would be the same in all these events. So, um, but that event would, you know, get triggered and a lot of different business rules that's payment oriented would get triggered. So it has nothing to do with, uh, this is just a, a step to kick off like another process. So uh, that's kind of how I see it. Makes, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do we have time for one more final yes. last? Yes, we have time. <laughs> um, all right. So, Dan, did you have anything in mind? Or because I'm also. Yeah, I can. Uh, so, there's a. Uh... There's a couple of questions I'm looking at. For instance, one of them, uh, I think it refers to a specific slide that you've shown. By the way, I love the slides and the oh, way you, you explain through it. Uh, so it's about the uh, autonomous decision slide. What if yeah. the booking module is down when the loyalty module's uh, customer was promoted, the event is broadcasted, uh, gets outdated the info. Okay, can you, can you repeat? I was looking at the slide. Uh, so what, what happens then? What if uh, the booking module is down when mm -hmm. the loyalty, loyalty module's customer was promoted, the event is broadcast? Ah, okay. So the, the thing about queuing is that modules can be down. So that message that is published by loyalty will be um, sitting in the queue. So the process could be down, but you're using a transport like Rabbit right like azure service bus or something to to do this uh, message uh, delivery so the responsibility of of that transport is to take messages that's been published and and put it in this uh, durable medium and and so the process can be done so when the process comes back up then the booking will will look at, ah, I got like five messages in my queue and then we'll start processing. So it isn't actually lost. And, and that's why introducing queuing is, is like a, a good way to make your components reliable. And when, when you use patterns like sagas, like um, one thing that I did was uh, like, uh, we had this module where we had to generate like a PDF document so a CSV file would be dropped and the CSV file would contain like uh, line items. Each line item would be need needed to get generate into a PDF document. So the original process that we had was like, you know, some something that would read these and would there was a, a service um, that would generate the documents. So it would make calls. The problem is uh, it's an RPC call and sometimes it can fail. So it could have done like three out of five PDFs and then like, boom, like, you know, the fourth one would break. And so we had to reprocess the batch. 
So the, the, what, I had, what I did as a POC to do the event-driven architecture was to use the saga pattern. And like, you know, still there was the WCF service that was actually generating the PDF. But it sends this message because the saga has a state object. I know how many um, like messages I sent to go and generate PDFs and I get the responses back. Oh, you know, three got completed, the fourth one failed. Then I can like, it ends up in the error queue. I just take that one message from the error queue and reprocess it back I, without having to regenerate all of the existing things I've already done. So the process can pick up from where the failure occurred and continue on. So, so this is where like messaging, like, you know, uh, increases your reliability as well. And, and, and to me, microservices is so many definitions for microservices, but what I'm looking for is like autonomy. Um, can, can this service be on its own? If it's booking, you know, can it, can it do its function? Uh, if, you know, like I, I think like I, uh, for me, the whole temporal coupling came to my, like I, I, it clicked for me at Starbucks. And, uh, and then eventually I, I read uh, Gregor Hope's, uh, uh, Hope's uh, um, Starbucks doesn't do a two-face commit. So if you look at the cashier and barista, right? And if we think of a world where the cashier walks every time, you know, you go and order and, you know, it's not going to work. Like simply waiting for the barista to go do all the work and give the coffee back to you and then charges the card doesn't work like that. Real life doesn't work like that. Real life, you know, um, if you think of um, they write your stuff in a cup and leave it on the desk, you can think of that desk as the queue, right? And you can think of the barista not being there, just like this booking module, right? Maybe the barista had a, a shift change. So like your booking module is down. And uh, so the new barista comes in, what does he do or what does she do? Uh, she just starts to pick up the, the, the cups and starts working. Same way, you know, these uh, messages are in the queue. And when your new booking um, service comes up, it starts to take the messages and process from the queue. So um, it, it's autonomous and, uh, you know, the cashier can still accept cards um, even when there's no barista. Uh, and, you know, so it kind of gives you this uh, reliable model as well. So to me, that's the essence of microservices. And, and, and for me, like DDD is like a fantastic design discipline. And Eric Evans' uh, book, um, it, it is a hard read, but it's a fantastic book. And I've, uh, I still have some parts that I have to go and reread. And there's probably a part that I haven't read. But like I, it's a constant like you know, um, I. But you know, I, I, I think I went back second time, and the second time I started from the back. I started from part four strategic design, and then opened up a whole new world, and and so it's like every time like I go back to uh, the DDD book, like I learn, I learn something. Even even when I reread, I I pick up something new. So. Um, so to me, that's why, like, you've, you've got these fundamental awesome concepts that DDD brings in, then you tie it with messaging, now you get, like, reliable and autonomous, um, and, and what else do we want, right, like, when we write software, so. <laughs> yeah, perfect, so, indeed, uh, Starbucks is a great example of how uh, message queues should work. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times, like, you know, uh, patterns come from real life and real life is event driven. Um, like, you know, like I was giving this talk and my dog walked in and she wanted to be let out. Like, you know, I have to react to that. So it, it is, it is very, very event driven. And like, if you look at, you know, um, McDonald's and Starbucks and, you know, it, it, they've solved these problems. Um, so, so sometimes it is like, we need to take a step back and kind of see what's going on around us. And some of all these patterns, pub sub, all, all that stuff comes from real world. So, um, and I can go on all day, 
like our human brain is completely autonomous and event driven. And if you want to learn more about that, there's a very interesting TED talk, um, Three Clues to Understanding Your Brain or, or something by Dr. Ven S. Venkat. But if you just like uh, search for TED Talk, Phantom Limb, you will find that talk. And, and that talk like just blew my mind. And, and I'm a nerd. I always connect things to event-driven architecture. And I, and I was like, yeah, our brain is completely event-driven, taking compensating actions when things fail and, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it is, it is very, very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, funny thing. So we've heard uh, your dog in the session. I think we also heard uh, Diana's dog in the first uh, talk. <laughs> Vlad, we haven't heard yours. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Where did you lock it? Vlad. I think we lost Vlad. <laughs> Can't hear Vlad. <laughs> Pro probably now he's uh, <laughs> taking care of the dog. <laughs> well, Indu, it was uh, a great talk. Uh, it was uh, also a great way to end this day. Yeah. For you, the day is uh, just starting. Right. Um, and uh, but anyway, thanks a lot for being part of uh, Code Camp. Yeah. Hope to do. Hope to do it again.